story about his friend, Ralph Milton. Tell us how Ralph woke up one morning to a loud sound coming from his roof. Sounded for all the world to him like somebody was sitting on his roof and banging on a boiler with a hammer. So he ran out to his backyard and looked up and there on his TV antenna on top of the roof, a woodpecker had perched and was doing his best to hammer that uh, metal pole on his house. And that's what was causing that terrible racket. And so uh, Ralph was upset at this woodpecker. He picked up a rock and, and flung it at the woodpecker, but he missed badly. And he heard it hit his car out front of the house. Now he's so disgusted, he just hauls back his foot and kicks a clod of dirt, forgetting that he was barefoot at the time. I think all that uh, pain that came his way, that was part of the fact that he was acting angrily at a woodpecker who didn't know better than to do what he was doing in the first place. And that reminds me of the fact that a contentious spirit leads to pain. You can be sure of that. It can be self-inflicted pain, or it can radiate out of our lives into the lives of other people in a wave of destruction, but it always produces pain. And that's at the heart of our text this morning. We're going to continue this morning with our sermon series from 2 Samuel. We come now to 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 8 through 17 for the next portion of this book. There we read, But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Manhanaim. He made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, even over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he came to be king over Israel, and he was king for two years. The house of Judah, however, followed David. The time that David was king of Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Now Abner, the son of Ner, went out from Manhanman to Gibeon with the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and Joab, the son of Zariah. And the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. Then Abner said to Joab, Now let the young men arise and hold a contest before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. So they arose and went over by count, twelve for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and twelve for the servants of David. Each one of them seized his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side so that they fell down together. Therefore that place was called Helkath Hazarim, which is in Gibeon. That day the battle was very severe and Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. Why don't you see in that text this morning the setting for this conflict? A week before last, in our morning message, we saw that Judah made David their king. In our text this morning, we see the other tribes of Israel have selected Ishbosheth, Saul's son, to be their king. Now, this is supposed to be one nation, Israel, chosen to be God's people in the world. They were supposed to be showing the light of God to the Gentiles. They were supposed to be the representation of God in this present world. And instead, what are they doing? They're dividing themselves at this point. They were becoming a nation divided against themselves. Now, I'm sure that there were people on both sides of this matter that thought that they were on the right side of the issue, 
but neither was listening to the other. They had chosen up sides before they had even consulted each other about what was right to do. And when people begin to take sides and stop listening to each other, it becomes a recipe for contention. Now we've talked just for a moment here this morning about the setting for the conflict. Let's talk about the cause for the conflict because it's not the same here. The cause for this conflict is Abner's contentiousness. That's the real source for what's happening here in this passage. Abner had been the commander of Saul's army, and as such, he had taken Saul's side against David. Now, David had never wronged Saul. David considered Saul to be God's anointed king, and all his dealings with Saul showed his regard for Saul as the man that God had chosen for that position. David refused to take his hand against Saul. Even after Saul's death, David was still defending Saul. David, though, had come to have an unreasonable hatred for David. And the problem wasn't with what David was doing to Saul. It was that Saul was jealous of David. Because David was a mighty warrior and gaining a reputation among the people. And he was popular everywhere he went. And that just burned Saul to no end. He saw how popular David was getting. People said, a call, a Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. And he didn't like the sound of that one bit. That David should be so much more popular than he was. And so he set his anger against David and determined to destroy David. The more people loved David, the more jealous of him Saul became. So it was Saul who was in the wrong. But Abner had been chasing David and his fighting men now for years at Saul's command. Abner had been heading up the army trying to search out David and trying to destroy him, trying to please Saul by destroying the man that Saul hated. Now, even after Saul is dead, Abner wants to press that feud. Abner's not ready to let it go. When Judah chose to make David their king, it upset Abner because he was still thinking of David as the enemy, the enemy of Saul, the enemy that Saul wanted to have eradicated. And so he decided to oppose David's reign by going around to the other tribes of Israel with Saul's son, Ishbosheth, and convincing them to make him the king. Actually, he sort of installed him as the king over each of the other tribes. He was still fighting the old war. He wanted to establish Saul's house on the throne and thus oppose David as king. You ever notice something? It takes everyone to maintain unity. It only takes one person to advance contention. It takes all of us working together for us to be united. It only takes one of us to have contention running through the people. Abner was determined to be that contentious one. Israel would not be united. Israel would not be at peace unless they went his way. Unless they did what Abner wanted them to do. And it didn't matter that David had been selected by God to be the next king after Saul was no longer the king. It didn't matter that he had been anointed by God's prophet to be that king. This wasn't something Abner wanted. And he was determined that Israel should be conformed 
to his will. I think we need to remind ourselves this morning that God's people have to avoid contention. Because of this contentious attitude, Abner wasn't content merely to divide Israel. He pushed them to bloodshed. When the two sides met at the pool of Gibeon, one side sat on one side of the pool and the other side sat on the other side of the pool for their meeting there. You can tell that they had something more than a pool between them at this time. But it's at this meeting of the leaders of God's people that Abner proposes to have the two sides each picks their 12 young champions, 12 young men who they think can represent their side in a fight. And that those 12 would go against the other side's 12. It's probably due to the fact that Israel had just been defeated by the Philistine army and still was under threat of the Philistines overrunning their country at all times that they didn't want to deplete their numbers through a civil war. It became easier to have champions represent each side so that only a few would be slaughtered in this contention between them. But if they could unite the country with limited bloodshed, they would remain stronger. Still, it was an escalation to go from division to open violent conflict, and that is what Abner was proposing. Abner got his wish. The 12 champions met the 12 champions of the other side. But it didn't go the way that Abner had intended. The men of Israel were soundly defeated. And David's men prevailed in that conflict. And it spawned a bloody battle in which Abner's forces were routed and made to flee for their lives. Note the cost of contention for God's people. The Philistines were a real threat to Israel. But the internal conflict proved to be worse for Israel. What was going on inside Israel turned out to be worse than even their harshest enemy from outside their ranks. I think that's often the way it is for the Lord's church today. Satan and this present sinful world are constantly looking for ways to destroy the church. They are coming against the church with power. But the most grave threat to the existence of any congregation, to the existence of the church itself, comes from within the church. Galatians chapter 5, verse 15, Paul says there, But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. It's that contentiousness within the ranks of the church which can destroy a church. When there arise schisms in the fellowship of the church, that is what can bring us to destruction. It's not the enemy outside the gates, as frightful as that enemy might be, but it's the presence of the Trojan horse inside the gates, in our very midst, that will defeat us. Conflict in the church, the spirit of contention in our midst, this is what we must be constantly seeking to eliminate. We can't afford to fail to keep watch for the enemies outside the church, but we must also be aware at all times of those who would seek disharmony within the church. And contention, just as we saw with Abner, contention comes from one trying to impose their will on others. That's not the nature that Christ wants for his church. John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus' words there, By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love 
for one another. Since it's the Lord's will that's to be done in the church and not any man's will, contention needs to be weeded out of the bride of Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14, and then going down to verse 23. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God, not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. And then Paul again writes, this time to Titus, in Titus chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Finally, from the pen of James in James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Too often the church in a community has the reputation for squabbling rather than for their love. Let us be careful not to follow the example of Abner and divide God's people due to our pettiness. Let us always look for God's will and his way. And let us determine that we individually will promote love among God's people and never seek strife and division. In conclusion this morning, we're not always going to agree on everything. There's no way that in a diverse group of people, such as the church brings together, people from different backgrounds, people from different cultures, people of different ages, people of different interests, there's no way we're going to agree about everything. We might not have the same taste on music. We might not like the order of the service that's been chose. We might not care for some of the decisions that have been made sometimes in our congregation. But regardless of whether everything is to our taste, or not, we can choose to treat one another with love and not to insist that everything be as we would like it. It's not truly our church, it's the Lord's church that we are members of. He is the head of the body, the church. And that's the spiritual maturity that is needed for a healthy church. Now abide faith. Hope and love, Paul wrote in the love chapter, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And the greatest of these is love. Let us model his love. The love that caused him to do what was hard for him to do for our sakes. That compelled him to go to the cross for us. Let us model that kind of love in the way that we interact with one another. And this morning, if you'd like to receive his love, if you'd like to receive what Christ did for you on the cross, for the first time, you can obey him in the waters of baptism, or if you'd like to renew your commitment to live for him, you can make that decision as well this morning. We're going to have an invitation time this morning. We're going to begin it with a word of prayer, and then we're going to go to a personal meditation. And if you need to make a decision publicly, just now we invite you to come forward during that time of meditation. Father, we thank you that we have in you the example of love, selfless love. And we pray, Lord, that we might not live as those people who are contentious and will divide up your church for our own motives and for our own purposes. Help us not to be petty, Lord.
Help us to be generous and loving as you are. Lord, this morning, if there's a decision that somebody needs to make, we pray, Lord, that that they might have your Holy Spirit moving on their hearts and that they might make that decision. So watch over us as we go through this brief time of meditation. We pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen.